Good morning and happy Monday. Happy Monday. Hopefully more people will bring their classes on and um, participate in this week's events. But good morning on behalf of Dr. Joyce Brown, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to our second annual Civility Week. Let's give a hand. My name is Ron Mylan. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer here at the college. And part of the Civility Week is part of a bigger college initiative to promote civility on campus, basically to promote a safe, inclusive, and civil campus. A campus where students, staff, and faculty can exchange ideas and, and be represented no matter who their beliefs or who they are. Last year's theme was on bias, and this year, how appropriate, it's on civility, politics, and empathy. Well, we need to send some of that in Washington. Oops, did I say that? Um, for many, civility are a set of rules from opening the door, allowing others to finish a statement before addressing. But civility is much more than that. It is complex. It is a set of behaviors. It's a process that continues on and on and on. Civility includes courtesy, politeness, mutual respect, friendliness, and good manners. Today's opening ceremony, along with the workshops and the movie, Won't You Be My Neighbor, about Mr. Rogers, who, who knows Mr. who's Mr. Rogers? Awesome hero, okay? And also my favorite event, um, Diversity Comic Con on Friday. But this work was done by many people, particularly the Civility Committee, the Diversity Council and the President's Office, and along with many other people here too. So I'd like to first of all just give a hand to some special people that are here today um, who has helped me so much, and that's Robin Sacken, who's gonna come up in a few. Um, ongoing support from Jack Oliva, our Vice President of Academic Affairs, and so many others. Remember to please pick up a bulletin um, to look at for the various events taking place on campus. And remember to promote civility every day, not just this week, but every single day. We have to set the example, and we have to be the one that our students look up to. At this time, I'd like to present Dr. Robin Sacken, president of the Faculty Senate and member of the Civility Planning Committee, and my dear friend who's going to give remarks. Oh, did I say doctor? Well, yes, you are. Come on now. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> By the way, real quick, while I got Robin here, um, I'm holding a ticket. This is a raffle ticket. Um, throughout the week, we will have a table at Feldman Hall, right, at first floor Feldman, and um, it's a free raffle ticket, and we're giving out a beautiful civility gift basket. So please, fill these out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to FIT Second Civility Week. As Ron said, this year the theme is civility, politics, and empathy. The next three days will be filled with workshops, panel discussions, and training on civility. This year, the keynote speaker is Alexander Hefner, who is the host of Open Mind and PBS. Today, we are faced with so much turmoil and insecurity in the world. Every day, the headline seems to be becoming worse and worse. So many people are suffering. Civility seems like that is lacking not only with our leaders in our country, but all over the world. Yet, there's still courage with some leaders who represent civility and empathy. For me, seeing President Carter at 95, having a terrible fall, but not letting him stop him, and caring about people by building homes for the less fortunate gave me some hope. So if we at FIT can embrace each other, and be civil towards each other, it would all be a small but significant gesture towards civility, diversity, and inclusion. Do not ever forget, you're a citizen of the world. In addition, there are things you can do to lift the human spirit, things that are easy, things that are free, and things that you can do every day. Civility, respect, kindness, and character. I'd like to thank President Brown, Dr. Ron, and the Civility Committee for working together on this fantastic program. I hope that you will all participate in the next three days of Civility Week. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Olivier, the Vice President of Academic Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, welcome to all of you, and also many thanks to Ron's leadership, Robin's um, partnership with this, and to everybody else here at FIT who are, is committed to this initiative and who make this week possible. It's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Alexander Hefner. As Robin noted, he's the host of Open Mind on PBS. Alexander has covered American politics, civic life, and millennials since the 2008 presidential campaign. His work has been profiled in numerous media outlets to include the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, as well as NBC News, MSNBC, C-SPAN, NPR, and the BBC. His writings have appeared in Time Magazine, USA, Wire, uh, USA Today, Wired, Routers, The Daily Beast, The Wall Street Journal, The Boston Globe, and others. And he also was the author of a documentary history of the United States, um, which was published by Penguin in 2018. Alexander founded and edited Scoop 08 and Scoop 44, the first ever online national student newspapers covering the 2008 presidential campaign and the first year of the Obama presidency. He is the recipient of the University of Denver's Anvil of Freedom Award, Franklin Pierce University's Fitzwater Medallion for Leadership in Public Communication, and Yale University's Pointer Fellowship in Journalism. Alexander holds degrees from Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, and from Harvard University. Alexander, welcome to FIT. Thank you, Provost. Uh, thank you, Diversity Committee. Uh, thank you to Ron for the invitation. I appreciate you being here this morning. I um, want to speak for about 25 minutes to a half hour and then open it up to questions for you all um, to engage in, uh, in thoughts as well. So I, I come at this question of civility as someone who hosts a weekly program that attempts to model facilitations in civil discourse each week. Um, so I might not always agree with the person with whom I'm conversing, uh, but there is a mutual respect, <clears throat> there is a mutual camaraderie, and there's a mutual allegiance when I invite someone on the open mind, a commitment to certain principles. Uh, and I think they're really basic human values and democratic norms that we ought to adhere to in conversation and dialogue and deliberation. But I go back to the original mandate of the open mind when it was founded by my grandfather in 1956. Uh, a year after which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. appeared in his first national television interview. Uh, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. And, you know, I don't know how much my grandfather valued the, the latter clause of that sentence, uh, but increasingly, as your professors uh, acknowledged, um, that seems pretty salient to highlight because it appears that our brains are splattered on the floor. And if you go to the Open Mind on YouTube, you'll see a five to seven second video introducing each new episode that attempts artistically, from a design perspective, to illustrate those splattered brains and maybe rescuing them from the floor and re-acclimating uh, ourselves to uh, civil society. So you know, that, that's one quote, but often when I speak to groups of student journalists and broader communities. Within the last couple of weeks, I was in uh, South Dakota, um, Richmond, Virginia, and most recently Durham, New Hampshire, at the University of New Hampshire. There, there seem to me two quotes that really embody the balancing act of civil society and achieving civil society today. And, and I want to first emphasize something that Ron did. ZZ Packer, the uh, author, talks about the manners and the morals of civility. And they go hand in hand. You can't ignore one dimension of civility in favor of another. So again, the manners and the morals. And I think of the manners and the morals, in Zizi's words, as together collectively being the equation to define civil society. Because we need manners and we need morals. Uh, and it's not simply about decorum or 
uh, sort of the standard operating procedure of how we might conceive of civility. It's about achieving civil society, and it's not only through discourse. It's dialogue, deliberation, I mentioned before, disagreement, sometimes discord, um, and ultimately, whether we're agreeing to disagree or disagreeably agreeing, at the, at the end of the day, we hope that the social capital is cultivated to produce um, society that is invested in certain core principles. And that requires civil disobedience, civil dialogue, civil discourse, uh, civil legislative proceedings. Um, and, and again, I think that that is the definition we ought to strive to, ad to adhere to, um, not simply manners or decorum. Uh, but how we are achieving or striving incrementally in a pendulum swinging democracy to achieve civil society. But there, there are two quotes to me that embody the manners and the morals um, from two different politicians, many decades apart. So I go on the road often and uh, some of these people are more familiar than others, but I think the first one would be pretty familiar to this audience. Um, from, from a couple centuries ago um, in a letter to abolitionist Horace Greeley, President Lincoln wrote, when new views become true views, I'll adopt them. Uh, and I think that quote is so fascinating because it really highlights the imperative of um, maturity. You know, our constitution was evolving. The, the, the standard or criteria for civil rights and human rights, that was evolving and that was materialized and manifested in amendments to our Constitution, but it didn't happen overnight, and it didn't happen just because someone, Lincoln, Seward, um, Sumner, Stevens, any of those abolitionists, because they said something, or because they gave a speech on the Senate floor, or from the Cabinet Room, or from the White House, it was, a, it was certainly an incremental process if a radical idea to actually insist that life, liberty, and happiness be extended along with emancipation and franchise to the entire body of people living in this country. Um, but I think Lincoln is grappling with those cha changing criteria of truth and morality. Again, manners and morals in defining what is civil and, and taking an enormous leadership role in setting aside what might be politically expedient to pursue and advance a tradition of constitutionality that we now, decades later, adhere to and we ought to hold and fasten as securely as humanly possible. And that is a standard of truth and morality that unites us in acknowledging the dignity of all human beings. So I often think of that quote, which is familiar to us, but even if it's a, a short quote, it, it highlights the fact that truth in an informed society is a vulnerable thing and subject to a disinformation and misinformation. And we have to be watchful of defining our truth constantly. And you know, society is not protean, facts are not protean. And when you see conditions that are antithetical to human values or democratic values or human values, it's our obligation, I think, to speak up and to use one of those avenues of discourse, dialogue, deliberation, disobedience to pursue the truth. The other quote, which I think being a local institution and myself from, from the state, I th many of you will appreciate, um, is more cliche. Lincoln, of course, puts it so eloquently in that letter, um, but it's something that was not founded by this United States Senator, um, but if you ask his staff members, um, his late chief of staff, um, his colleagues on the Hill, um, his, um, his friends and family. Um, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who uniquely uh, served uh, a Republican president as UN ambassador, but also as a Democratic senator and had a pedigree um, right here in academia, not physically in this space, but had uh, rigorous training in economics and political science. Um, he told his staff often, you know, you're entitled to your own opinions, not your own facts, and that kind of has become a cliche in an era of social media in which we are threatened by the scourge of disinformation and misinformation. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, he was imparting to those who were informing his policy 
um, his legislative aides, his uh, policy advisors, that you need to provide rigorous evidence and substantiation for points that you're making. Um, and he was a controversial figure in his own right in some sense, um, but it was through his own scholarship that he wanted to prove to New Yorkers, I think, that he believed in a rigorous approach to public policy, even if he was acknowledging conditions that were less than civil, conditions that he wanted to correct. Um, and many, laid, many years later, I think, he, he proved his bona fides as someone who was committed to both the democratic and human values that were going to advance the condition of people, um, not to, I think, our satisfaction or to New York's satisfaction, um, but his intent, I think, was to honor those basic principles. Um, so I think civility is how we manage those two ideas, that there are certain um, truths, objective truths, um, that must be reiterated. Um, and at the same time, there are conditions that are constantly changing around us that um, require us to be discerning. Um, discerning not just so that we're informed citizens, so that we can embrace the values of informed citizenship in every single community that we're a part of. So that's our friends and family, that's our neighbors, that's our dorm mates, that's our colleagues, our, our peers, our, our um, our entire educational and political community. Um, so <clears throat> I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to, to set the terms from the outset. How do we define a civility and make sure people are aware of a more multifaceted approach to the problem of uncivil political rhetoric and behavior? Uh, because that's a component of it, but there's also a forward-looking, proactive definition of how we can behave pro-socially, behave um, in a way that's going to be constructive and productive and now not destructive and counterproductive. And so a lot of times I think we are lacking the appropriate tools to listen and be empathetic and, and, and sort of engage in the process of empathetic learning. And I've devoted a lot of my career to both practicing and talking about um, civility. And I, and I think the three obstacles that are most paramount to achieving civil society are uh, bigotry, obstructionism, and dysfunction. Um, now, I think there are a lot of eggs and chickens in this basket. Um, so you can't necessarily identify only one as the problem. But I really do find that bigotry is the principal culprit. Um, and I don't just mean it in terms of religious or racial bigotry with which our country is familiar. And unfortunately, bad actors have practiced uncivil discourse and rhetoric and behavior towards uh, minority groups and have sought to stigmatize and dehumanize de um, and, and cast aside um, and deplatform uh, people who didn't look like them or didn't uh, believe in the same uh, religious tradition as them. I think today we're grappling with in, in this kind of electoral college math of, of suburban and rural and urban this geographic diversity question. And, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate of intellectual honesty before anything else. So I, I don't think that <clears throat> someone's resentment um, ought to afford them clearance or license to any kind of big, bigotry or bigoted behavior. But if you're bigoted from the outset, it means you're closed-minded and you can't undertake the dialogue. You can't get to first base. And if that's bigotry, whether it's racial, religious, geographic, or any other kind of bigotry that's just closed-minded because of your religious conviction or your skin color or the state you're from or your registration at the ballot box, you know, then you can't really undertake the grand experiment of deliberative democracy. Um, and we see that, as Ron alluded to, the primary vehicles or vessels for legislative progress are stymied and at constant impasse because of the inability to overcome that bigotry. Uh, and I think the bigotry exists in so many different forms 
But an end result of that bigotry is obstruction. It's obstruction when a senator refuses to hear um, the case for a Supreme Court nominee, refuses to take up a hearing, um, much less vote on uh, a Supreme Court nominee. It's, it's, um, it's manifest in the gridlock that ensnares any piece of major legislation that our country is trying to achieve or has tried to achieve over the last couple of decades. Um, you know, John Stewart points out correctly that something as just and obviously just as compensation for the victims of 9-11 and their families, um, the, the compensation legislation, the, the Zadroga Act, uh, any of the measures that have sought to provide relief and compensation to victims or families or first responders, that that is a source of culture war. And it's a source of culture war because the majority leader of the United States Senate refuses to acknowledge the dignity of folks who passed and who are struggling uh, as a consequence of 9-11. And so I think that on so many issues where it is just obvious that there's human peril and we're endangering our fellow Americans, we're still thrust into this combat of bigotry begetting obstruction, begetting dysfunction. Uh, and, it, and it's a shame. Um, it's a shame and it's regrettable, <clears throat> but I think we're starting to see movement in the right direction. Um, we're starting to see folks who, <clears throat> excuse me, who are waking up to political courage amid all the cowardice. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, civility is defined by who shows up and politics is the art of the possible, but it's also the art of Shakespeare. <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a cold. Um, when you see the candidates for office now debating, uh, most recently this past week, and you see their moral fiber, and you see what they're made of, you, see, you realize, well, all these things are in our control. You know, in terms of democratic representation that's gonna embody the values to beat and push back against the bigotry, the obstructionism, the dysfunction. And I think those personalities that were on display for, <clears throat> for, for in large measure are quite capable, uh, whether it's Mayor Pete or Senator Warren, of taking back the discourse to a more normal place. Um, <clears throat> yes, we've had presidents, and, and, and Trump is much like Andrew Johnson and Andrew Jackson too, <clears throat> who have engaged in bellicose, acrimonious, divisive rhetoric. But we've also had presidents, both conservative and liberal presidents, who did not undertake that kind of blatantly uncivil vocabulary in diatribes that are set up to function in a culture war. Um, so I think there are solutions at the micro and macro level to the incivility that plagues our country. You're starting to see, and I really think it started with the Parkland students, <clears throat> you're seeing galvanized, organized young people, millennials, post-millennials, Gen Z we, we call them, who are um, taking um, common cause in rescuing the democratic and human values that they see uh, lost upon us right now. And of course, if you go to City Hall, or if you go to town hall meetings, we know that politics at the local level, um, it may be more accessible. Um, but, and you saw, for example, in Florida, in response to the horror of Parkland in the decades of this gun violence epidemic, that these students, even if they were making gradual change to Florida law, they did so, and they did so admirably. And I think that a lot of that comes from the framing and the design of a counter movement. Uh, to challenge the status quo, um, what I described as the, as the bigotry and the phenomena that, are, that beget kind of or emanate out of the bigotry. <clears throat> and whether we're looking at the debate stage, we're looking at the Parkland students, or we're looking at just examples of our friends, peers, neighbors, uh, family who are engaged in political um, discourse and, and deliberation, I think we're seeing <clears throat> that clicktivism the social media environment, is not really sufficient grounds to build on um, a kind of fertile 
counter movement to uncivil politics. Um, <clears throat> I'm talking about the favorites and the likes and you know the social media movement. I think that the post-millennial generation that interestingly came of age with Snapchat and not, Encyclopedia, and, <clears throat> and not Encyclopedia Britannica is perceptive enough to realize that political change still comes from grassroots movements and especially encountering the complicit force of social media in being a totalitarian or a wannabe totalitarian's best friend. Um, there, there is a uh, movement now underway to challenge not just uncivil political theater, but the, the um, incubators of that incivility, which have been in recent months and years, <clears throat> social media organizations and web platforms weaponized for malicious disinformation and uh, other misinformation. Of course, it's important, I think, for student communities to differentiate between dis and miss, right? Dis has malicious intent and ulterior motive to misinform people. Um, misinformation does not necessarily have that same motivation. It could be an error that was an unintended error, but disinformation is what is weaponized on social platforms that lack context, that lack rules of the road when it comes to manners or morals of civility and our breeding grounds of not only political violence, but this ongoing saga of whether we want to legitimize hate again in this country. And so <clears throat> not just is it important for us to look at the presidential candidates who are embodying different values of civility or civil discourse, and to look to movements like the Parkland students, <coughs> but also to understand our own digital footprint in this ecosystem. We can be part of the solution, <clears throat> but we can also ignore that we are the basis on which Facebook and Twitter and all these platforms exist. And you know, you don't see protests of social media policy that <clears throat> you know profiteers off of racism and bigotry. You don't see that kind of live grassroots energy demanding civility from Facebook CEO or Twitter CEO or Alphabet CEO. And there have been so many, numerous examples where you would think that their behavior and irresponsibility, just the abdication of responsibility to promote civil discourse, would have incited or inspired that same kind of grassroots movement. <clears throat> it hasn't happened yet. Um, and I'm happy to expound on why I think it hasn't happened yet. I mean, one of, it's sort of a background actor. You can see the gun violence, you can see the mental illness in a way that <clears throat> these um, social platforms, if you participate on them in a, in a friendly or collegial or happy way, then maybe you just wanna ignore their deficit of civility and all the users who exploit the, the fact that they can operate and their hardware can operate as an authoritarian's best friend. Um, <clears throat> it's up to shareholders, but it's up to users ultimately. And anyone who has social media or uses social media <clears throat> or platforms online anyway, I'd like to point out to students that not only is Firefox, I think the best designed web browser, it's also the only popular nonprofit web browser. Uh, that's making a pact with its users that it's not going to sell your cookies, your web traffic, your private information. Whereas Google Chrome and uh, Safari, Apple and all the other for-profit browsers are not really leveling with you about what their intent is. And you know that when it comes to the bottom line, these social platforms <clears throat> and these browsers really are driving at the profit imperative and impetus and not the, the question of social responsibility and the ultimate consequence of, of their behavior. <clears throat> so it comes down to shareholders, users. You know, I wrote a piece in the Christian Science Monitor when Facebook went public and said it should gift each user one share, um, which may or may not have been economically feasible, but it was an innovative design of a way to conceive of a for-profit website <clears throat> with the intent and imperative of a Wikipedia. 
this idea that public and private partnerships are going to resolve the incivility crisis, that's, to you quote Joe Biden, that's malarkey, you know, one of his favorite words, malarkey. It's just malarkey. There's no criteria right now that is establishing <clears throat> or incentivizing uh, good behavior <coughs> from the social media actors. And, and that means we have to take it in our own hands. Um, and political advocacy and, and political civility, if you will, and empathetic learning, getting sort of to the core of people's grievances. And I like to say we all have aspirations and resentments in this country. You know, individually, personally, familially, I don't think we should ever deny that. That's like reality. We're all imperfect. We all have our own resentments and, and, and aspirations. And I think it's, it's, in, it's really imperative that we get at the core of causation. We get at how people arrive at their convictions and we listen concertedly and empathetically. But we can't deny that there's certain syst systemic <clears throat> problems in both the political and communications culture that are promoting <clears throat> so much incivility right now that the idea that one and two and dozens of focus groups will blossom in this country and resolve the problem, I think, is a pipe dream. Although I go to campuses, as I said, as diverse as Santa Clara, University of South Dakota, here, and try to facilitate workshops to promote values of civil discourse and talk about the competing challenges both at the grassroots level on campus and then more broadly in state and federal government and how those ideas of bigotry, obstructionism, and dysfunction um, our handicapping, um, our, again, our dormitories, our state houses, and, and our White House and Congress. I mean, so that is part of the solution, an empathetic learning, understanding how someone arrived at a conclusion, even if it's not empirically or, or statistically substantiated. That's important, the storytelling and, 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 and seeking out the power of story and listening and kind of catharsis of storytelling. And I encourage it. I, I hope you, in the classroom and as students navigating today's political culture, pursue that kind of learning to the best of your ability. We want to encourage brave and safe, safe spaces, as uh, John Palfrey, the educator, talks about. Um, <clears throat> and that requires getting out of our comfort zone again, within reason so that we can understand people's perspectives even if they're not consistent with ours, especially if they're not consistent with ours, and giving ourselves an opportunity to, to kind of go in depth and have those exchanges. That's, that's critical. But I hope you leave here today, and now I want to open it up to questions, with some idea of where you as professors, as academics, as students can be part of a uh, a solution at the, at the macro and the micro level. <clears throat> I like to say we need to amuse our democracy back to life. Um, I, I'm sure Ron's heard that on the open mind before. There's no doubt that reality TV culture is the bloodstream in which we function today. It's our MO, right? It's, it's that, that's not going away. The ship will not sail from that, just as it will not sail from a hyper-connected technological revolution. Now, does it have to be Facebook? Can it be a Wikipedia model that's incentivizing knowledge and <clears throat> mutual respect and building communities of learners? Yeah, it can be that model. That ship hasn't sailed. Can it be browsers like Mozilla Firefox that are pledging to honor the integrity of your, your uh, privacy and personal data? Yes, um, there's a professor, you know, a mile or two away who sued uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. I interviewed him on The Open Mind, who's the subject of the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack. He's uh, over at Parsons. <clears throat> you can see The Open Mind interview on The Great Hack on Netflix. He's taking a leadership role in seeing the systemic flaws of uh, institutions that pr promote uncivil uh, politics and media and saying, I want to own my data in this country. Why is it that in Europe, you can own data or you can at least pursue through the judicial process ownership of data, but we can't do it here in the United States. <clears throat> so I hope you take away that there are so many options in terms of issues with, with which we're grappling. 
to take an active role, and it can be digital economy, our, our digital data rights. <clears throat> it, you know, as Andrew Yang said at the last debate, our digital data is more powerful, more potent, and more valuable than oil. It's true. Maybe not uh, Facebook giving each one of us a share, but maybe <clears throat> with the right politics sensitive to the overwhelming condition of inequality in this country, the incivility of inequity, that <clears throat> in a more fair economy, in a smarter designed social media universe, websites like Facebook and Alphabet, YouTube, <clears throat> would acknowledge that they, again, they wouldn't exist without us and therefore, for every dollar they make, uh, a certain percentage should go to the American people, should go to every single user who is being exploited right now and give them the opportunity to fairly consent to their data being used by an Amazon again or a Google or a Facebook. <clears throat> These are things that are within our grasp in, in this, in this um, era. And so it's time to innovate when it comes to the policy so that we amuse our democracy back to life. Otherwise, you see the consequence of a reality TV president. I was on with uh, the Rev, uh, Rev Al um, on Saturday on MSNBC, and I said, <clears throat> this presidency is an Orwellian reality TV show. Up is down, left is right. Security is insecurity. Masked as bravado, and, and, and that's, that's the truth. So, you know, I wonder what the media critic Neil Postman would say about this moment, because it was his amusing ourselves to death that really predicted the scenario we're in today, his, his book. And that's the, the change that I make to the quote, how can we amuse our democracy back to life? Um, I think there are ways to do it. I want to maybe take questions in that vein, in that spirit. One idea I've had from my own journalistic perspective is why can't there be, and why hasn't there been, and I can tell you why, but an amazing race to solve the immigration problem, comprehensive immigration reform. <clears throat> the amazing race being the reality TV structure in which there is some adventure to achieving something <clears throat> that is, you know, a physical undertaking and through our, our human spirit and, and our physical prowess and our skills and our unique skills to, to rationalize, to, to be rational and use our language, which makes us distinct from other mammals, to use our unique linguistic capa uh, capabilities and, and our physical skills to... Uh, climb a mountain, you know, and why didn't the mainstream media say, you know, we're not just left and right, you know, at least one of us or one of our networks or one public TV program wants to get someone like the late John McCain and Pat Leahy uh, in, in a room together, Pat Leahy, a Democrat from Vermont, Senator McCain was, as you know, a Republican from Arizona, wake up with their morning coffee, dogs, cats, wives, children and actually do a reality TV show that's going to achieve that goal of renewing those democratic and human values that make America what it is or what it aspires to be. And so there are solutions even at that macro level. I was in New Hampshire as a fellow at the Fitzwater Center and there was this idea in 2016, why don't we have a democratic process because New Hampshire, first in the nation, primary their license plate says, live free or die. <clears throat> it's an open primary state, so you can be a Republican and vote for one of the Democrats, or you can be an independent and vote for one of the Republicans. And, and we said, in conjunction with the institution where I was a fellow, Franklin Pierce University and New Hampshire PBS, let's invite all the candidates in a non-incumbent year to have a, a civil dialogue, a primary dialogue, we were going to call it. The reason it didn't happen is because the DNC and RNC, even though people like Senator Sanders back in 2016 wanted to participate, wanted to have a conversation with some of his Republican counterparts, the DNC and the RNC said, <clears throat> we're going to block you from entering the sanctioned 
high profile events on ABC, CBS, NBC, if you come to our primary dialogue. We did the planning, we vetted three issues of real pivotal concern to New Hampshire voters, and for what? You don't remember the issues of concern except Chris Christie jabbing Marco Rubio for sounding like an automaton in Manchurian Canada. I mean, you remember it for that kind of amusement that instead of bringing our democracy back to life. So we have to challenge, and I hope you all, and see a lot of people who may be professors or uh, affiliated with the university here, um, you know, we need to, I think, encourage young people especially to be imaginative in the ways that they want to foster civil discourse in the future. And that means acknowledging that there's a certain mode of learning right now fueled by the reality TV show culture, which has been going on for some decades. It's not just millennials. I think pre-millennials got that fixed too. But absorbing that and trying to channel it constructively towards the future, that is really the test of whether or not we can survive, I think, as a country and as an informed citizenry. Um, with that, I really want to thank you for your time this morning, for your patience, as I am still recovering a bit from a, from a cold. But I hope you took something away from this nevertheless. And I'm really delighted to, to answer a few questions if you have any. So thanks for coming out this morning. <clears throat>
and the fact that we're, if we're denying people, in effect, franchise and opportunity to be um, independent and economically free um, and, and economically vital, then we have a, 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 an, an economy that has not democratized at all. Um, so I, I think that the design piece of this is really crucial in figuring out how we can democratize our economy because that has stalled totally and we, we live very much in an oligarchic system. So when people talk about the democratization of the web, be very specific about what you mean. You mean certain digital tools that make it possible to have a product drone to you in 24 hours. That's what you mean. You don't mean your well-being or your family's well-being. Well, it works, again, at warp speed. You know, you've probably heard of the deep fake, right? The idea that you can make a video now of someone saying something that they didn't say using the basic art. You know, they've done this with President Obama and other public figures. So, I mean, there's so many more ways to, um, I don't want to use the word innovate because it's often a positive connotation, but you know what I mean. Uh, devilishly kind of um, uh, exploit the power of new technologies, whether it's cyber espionage, hacking, or maliciously constructed deep fakes. So, you know, there is a world of opportunity for cyber villains, and the speed at which that can be accomplished is so much greater. You know, before, you know, Jefferson and Adams were planting uh, pamphlets and, and op-eds in, in, the, in the weekly or daily publication, maybe making some unsavory insinuations about their you know, their respective love lives. <laughs> that took time and that was personal stories and that wasn't affecting society at large in the same way. So I think it's a hugely different and also people, even if they were reading pamphlets and even if they wanted some salacious content, they still read beyond 180 or 140 or 280 characters. And that's the difference in people's inability or intolerance with depth. So when I say that Twitter is an authoritarian's best friend or an autocrat's best friend, it's because of the lack of context. And of course, Twitter and Facebook have promised things that they haven't delivered on since 2016. I think again, just like with the political question, it's about the characters and, and their, their aspirations and their resentments and how they figure into this. You know, by that I mean, <clears throat> are networks or individual hosts or journalists really demonstrating their motivations to be constructive? I, I less so am concerned about the blurring of the lines, which has always happened in one form or another. Um, I'm more concerned with the use of the term fake news. You know, Kathleen Hall Jameson at Annenberg has said we must, must, must reject that term. And if we're going to allude to the enactment of disinformation, use the term viral deception. Um, she says it's much more like a venereal disease than, you know, than we, than we want to acknowledge, which, you know, on a, on a campus but in a country, um, is, uh, is contagious and, and sort of morbidly contagious, too. So, this is misinformation, but
but even worse, often disinformation programmed to deceive people through viral means. And so yes, there, there are sort of two edges to that sword or, or two inputs. One is the input of maybe a traditional journalist, if you will, or a commentator who is being incentivized by something that is, that is incorrect or some allegiance to a party or to a person who would want to sell you something that's incorrect. And then the, the dissemination vehicle. Um, so I think we just, I, I'm not so concerned as, as you suggest, and I don't know that you need to be about uh, delineating those lines, um, but rather being explicit in calling out what is viral deception and when people are seeking to deceive you. And being, you know, you have to be very watchful of that. But someone saying, for instance, that some behavior is unconstitutional, like, uh, emoluments, for instance, and what Trump was attempting to do with the G7, you know, that that is objectively unconstitutional. I mean, I love what Speaker Pelosi said, a republic if you can keep it, quoting Benjamin Franklin, because that's exactly where we are, a press if you can keep it, if you can keep it free, if you can keep it honest, intellectually honest. And so there, there are definitely issues where there are more gray areas and journalists have to grapple with them accordingly, but there's so many areas now where there are black and white and therefore you have to be you know, honest. I did the same thing on my show when interviewing someone about Roy Moore and politics in Alabama, and when people go on, even MSNBC, you don't have to hear this on Fox News and say, constitutionalist Roy Moore. No, anti-constitutionalist Roy Moore. I mean, if, so, if you're talking about someone who wants to eradicate or calls the, the civil rights amendments to the Constitution irrelevant, you're talking about someone who's against the contemporary constitution. So a constitution and a republic, if you can keep it, or them. And we understand, and I don't think you have to be a New Yorker, I think you can be in any of the places I just mentioned, South Dakotan, Californian, uh, from New Hampshire, and also acknowledge those basic principles. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I hope it is. <clears throat> Yeah. Great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there was a foundation that they were building on. But I think one of the things that, that was different about Parkland is it was really setting some political goals. And in the case of, we all know that the guns are coming from Indiana, primarily. They're coming, in, in the case of Chicago violence, the, in the case of Maryland violence, I, I haven't studied that as closely. But we know that states with gun laws that are you know, far more uh, accessible for potentially, you know, mentally ill or violent people, those t tend to be um, the redder states that have um, more open gun laws. And so we, we know that the, the problem is not in those jurisdictions specifically, and therefore, how can you galvanize a political movement around legislative reform? And I know I have a friend who studied at Notre Dame and was involved in trying to make people aware of Indiana's role in culpability in, in the gun violence. But it's, the, the Parkland example was able to find um, some alliance with the legislative bodies there and actually demand reform and work towards electing what would have been Governor Gillum or um, what would have been re-electing Senator Nelson, and unfortunately the political might wasn't there, but the previous governor did end up signing some um, legislation into, into law um, that made a little bit of a difference. So I think that AOC's movement um, can be specifically harnessed in a way to, to serve communities where political leadership has not kind of kept up with the necessary policy to be innovative and imaginative, like I was saying, because 
you know, if folks have guns that are coming from outside of your jurisdiction, well, you need a political challenge and campaign to deal with that problem. So, but to answer your question, I think individual episodes of gun violence, including examples of police corruption and brutality, did set the page for a um, multimedia social experience that could help facilitate people's learning. But let's just remember that those marches with hundreds of thousands of people on multiple days were probably the most decisive. Um, and, uh, and so I think while Parkland learned from those episodes you described, those episodes and those particular constituencies or municipalities can also learn from Parkland. <laughs> but they love W and they love Ellen. So at least some of them, right? It's <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, you know, it's, I, I do have a thought on that. I'm really glad you asked that question um, because you know, so many people have focused on um, the Bush administration's war, you know, the, uh, Iraq and the calamity of Iraq, and, and not that that shouldn't be the point of, of focus, but if you really are making the case, you know, Ellen, come on, be cognizant that if, you know, Alito and Roberts had had their way, you know, you would have been denied citizenship in a major Supreme Court case, which we take for granted now, but it was a 5-4 decision. I mean, so those people who are talking about the war in Iraq, I think that's one of the reasons that the pushback hasn't been kind of critically or astute. It hasn't talked about the issue on which there is a hypocrisy there. And it's vitally important to acknowledge that just as it's, as it's vitally important to recognize their friendship is charming, their friendship is endearing, the country needs more examples of that kind of bipartisan imagery and leadership, you know, one, another example besides the idea of facilitating an amazing race to legis bipartisan legislative success is what Beto O'Rourke and Will Hurd <coughs> did. Neighboring congressmen, Democrat O'Rourke, Republican Hurd, took their, one of their cars, drove from their districts in Texas with Facebook Live on in their car all the way to D.C., talked about their families, their friends, public policy, and, and that's an enactment of, of civil discourse. And, and, and just as much, and I would say more than seeing um, Ellen and, and President Bush and, and uh, Jerry Jones' uh, suite uh, having a good laugh. I mean, let's, let's be honest, too, about what is substantive in nature to facilitate uh, discourse and to further discourse. And, and so I think those people who are <clears throat> critical of Ellen ought to look towards the Supreme Court and not towards Iraq, and they also ought to acknowledge, you know, okay, well, how can I be constructive in advising Ellen on how to maybe, you have this amazing platform, take it to the next level. Uh, and we've seen some, some media figures who have that level of spotlight say, John Stewart in particular, you know, I'm not gonna waste it, uh, and I'm gonna fight for people and certain values that are, that are important to me because there were 9-11 survivors who were conservatives who were liberals, families that were traumatized and fell victim to that you know, awful terrorist attack and ought to stand up for, for people of all stripes uh, who face that kind of trauma. And being New Yorkers primarily in this room, myself included, you know, that, that is a source of constant um, resilience, revitalization, um, that we can see each other from that, from that point of view of coming together as a country in, in the aftermath of, of those events and the, the kind of ongoing aftermath and what John Stewart did to advocate for Zadroga and, and uh, first responders. Thank you, I'm happy to stick around here for a few minutes if you have other questions too. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much, thanks. And thank you for coming and please participate in the events that we have this week and um, have an awesome day and awesome week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Good job. Okay, great. Sorry about my voice. That's okay. Did okay. <laughs>